Little Nightmares 2 not only surpasses its predecessor in a plethora of ways, but I also consider it to be the best game that's ever come out of the side-scrolling horror genre. When I say that, I'm referencing Limbo, Inside, and the first Little Nightmares, but this game is by far the most creative and intuitive of the bunch I've played, not to mention very disturbing in more ways than a few. That being said, most if not all of the problems from Little Nightmares 1 are carried over to Little Nightmares 2, preventing it from becoming the clean-cut horror gem that it almost is. Spoiler-free breakdown comes first, followed by a story and full spoiler review. Welcome to the lab, let's get started. Little Nightmares 2 immediately puts itself ahead of the first with the beginning moments of the game. There's an instant distinction between the visuals of the two games, besides one glaring issue. The glaring issue I'm speaking of are the textures. On Ultra Graphics, if you look too close at some of these textures, they either look decent, blurry, or on par with the original game from 2017. However, the scope of the environments, the reflections, and most of all the lighting are incredibly improved upon from the original. The first game has this yellowish dark palette to it, while the new one has a more blue hue to the overall feel. It makes everything feel melded together and blended with the darkness, and more like you're a small creature in this giant dark world. There's more scenarios in which you can move further back into the environment, temporarily shattering the illusion that it's just a side-scroller. Content-wise, there's a lot more here than in the first Little Nightmares. Longer chapters, more enemies, and more intense scenarios. Considering this game probably takes double the amount of time it takes to complete the first game, I'd consider this one the most worth of the two to purchase at full price, though it's still a short game. It runs for $29.99 at full price, and my first playthrough took four and a half hours to complete. Because of the aesthetic and the good experience I had, I personally consider that worth the price, but we all have our own personal opinions on value. As for the gameplay, uh, there's a lot of new mechanics here as well. But before I say anything, I would straight up not recommend playing this game at all without a controller. It simply just wasn't designed to be very compatible with the keyboard and mouse. Movement can be too clunky, turning your character in the right direction is essential. The weight of jumping and crouching and moving just isn't the same without a controller. It is undoubtedly not fun with a keyboard and mouse, and there's even a message when you first launch the game asking you to use a controller. In your eyes, if that seems negligent from the developers for a game that you can purchase on the PC, then that's understandable. But I'm personally not going to dock any points for that. I think it's just rooted into the way that the game plays and was designed, and that goes for the first one too. While I feel that I'm on the topic of a somewhat negative aspect, I actually encountered a couple of bugs in the game as well. There were three instances in which I got stuck completely. In two of them, I managed to get unstuck by mashing buttons on my controller, but in one of them I had to reload the entire checkpoint, which annoyed me since I was immersed in the tense situation I was in. I don't ever remember getting stuck at all in the first game. But now, back to the gameplay. It essentially plays like a co-op game, but by yourself. The character you control is named Mono, and the AI is named Six, who was the playable character in the first game. Six is required in order to progress through the game and complete some puzzles, and there's a button specifically meant to call her over in order to trigger her into helping you. Now all of that's great and all, but the best part of there being two characters is that you can hold hands. That is adorable. But besides all of that stuff, how's the part of the experience that really matters? How horrifying is this game? How disturbing? How effective? Well, in those regards, it's fantastic. This series of games are some of the only examples I've seen of body horror in video games. Sure, other horror games have disgusting looking monsters, but this series has disgusting looking people that may as well be monsters. It explores the grotesque. The enemies are either gluttonous or warped in some way or another. None of the corpses that you come across look at peace. Everyone's bodies are all twisted and bulging. It's wonderfully horrific. But what dominates over everything else, what really separates this game from the rest of the crowd is its strongest aspect, and that's its sounds. Every sound is incredibly crisp and powerful. <laughs> oh. 
Each enemy makes their own distinct sounds. Some sound effects play harmoniously with enemy movement or with the music. There's always an auditory trigger that happens when an enemy spots you, and the music really heightens the intensity of the chase segments. Now, without spoiling the story, I would say the progression of events is decent, though much like the first game, the overall events and backstory for the environments are very vague, and a lot of it is left out for interpretation. And on that note, it's time for me to move on to the spoiler section. So if what I've described sounds interesting to you, I would definitely recommend this game. If the aesthetic and the concept really speak to you, then it's definitely worth the full price. You'll probably play through the game more than once. If you're just looking for a good horror game, then I'd say wait for at least a $5 price reduction in a sale. Alright, here come the spoilers. The game begins in a forest at night, with Mana waking up next to a television after seemingly having a nightmare. You have no context for this situation, you're just walking through the forest which acts as the tutorial. Immediately I was reminded of the game Inside, but the scope of this scenario already seemed a lot wider. You learn about the mechanics, jumping, climbing, platforming, and a small introduction with puzzles and death with these bear traps hidden in the leaves that you can use pine cones to trigger. You're also given sticks to search through the leaves for bear traps as well which is also how melee weapons are introduced into the game, a new feature. Though you aren't really sure as the player where you're going, Mono is currently on his way to free Six from captivity. Now let me preface me talking about the story by quickly stating that I have done no additional research about the actual plot of the story or its literal explanations, since I prefer my reviews on new games to be more reactionary than anything else. And also, this game leaves its plot points very vague, and I believe that's intentional. So just keep in mind that everything I say about the story from now on are my own personal interpretations. Back to the game, Mono frees Six by going into the basement of this hunter's house. It isn't explained how Mono knew Six was there, or why these corpses in the house are so distorted, but the markings and drawings on her wall are foreshadowing what's to come. Mono immediately proves to be a tiny little badass by freeing Six, but first she flees from him. Upon catching up to her, she decides it's better to cooperate with him in order to escape. After a couple of cooperative sections, you encounter the first major enemy known as the Hunter. I actually find his character model to be somewhat boring, but they make up for it by having really intense chase and stealth sequences with him. The monsters in this game all have their own gimmick, which keeps things fresh and keeps you on your toes. In the case of the Hunter, his gimmick is that he can shoot you with a fucking gun. So you're pretty much dead if he spots you and there's no cover around. There's an alternation between chase and stealth for a while, but it's concluded with Mono and Six working together to actually kill the hunter, which caught me off guard if I'm gonna be honest. By this point, the game struck me as bolder than the first, and I imagined from this moment forward the game would be more confrontational than the first, and I was right. After a few somber moments, the duo arrive in a large warped city and begin walking through the streets, then come across a television, which Mono seems to have a strange hypnotic draw towards. You get pulled into this TV world, and the ambience makes it seem like something bad is behind this door here, but Six pulls Mono out shortly after. This event doesn't really mean anything right now, so then the game moves on to Chapter 2, which is the school. Almost immediately, Six is captured by these clay school children, so more than half of the chapter is done by yourself. For the first time in this series, you have the ability to attack enemies with melee weapons, and it's all about timing. Being able to fight back makes the gameplay a little more interesting, and it made me like Mono even more, since he never seems scared to confront any of these things. A bit further into the chapter, the next enemy, the teacher, is introduced. Her gimmick is infinitely stretching her neck, which is not only uncomfortable, but also makes her virtually impossible to run away from. So if you get spotted during these segments, you're basically instantly dead. The sneaking segments during the teacher encounters were my favorite monster encounters in the game, as it was really foreboding knowing that once you're spotted, you don't even have a chance. There's this one portion where you're sneaking through a library as she stands on the other side of the bookshelf, and as she searches for you, you have to maneuver around the towers of books with climbing to avoid her sight. I thought it was a neat use of platforming and horror blended together. I personally didn't find the clay school children creepy by themselves, but I did enjoy how unsettling it is that they can just fall apart into pieces. 
The melee segments with defending yourself against the school kids was actually somewhat annoying since the checkpoints were sparse. What happened a couple of times was that I would get through the combat portion, and one last school kid would pop out of nowhere and kill me, forcing me to start the whole segment all over again. It wasn't very fun. You eventually find Six and rescue her, then the duo escape the school in a short but intense chase sequence which also concludes the second chapter. So overall, I'd say chapter 2 is what encapsulates the entirety of what the game has to offer. There were puzzles that weren't too easy or too difficult, entertaining stealth sections, chase sequences, platforming, and the melee combat. It was all condensed fairly well into a chapter that takes roughly an hour to complete, and I think that's what separates this game from others of its type. Usually sections like these are heavily separated, even in the first game, but not in this case. It's pretty well done. There's another segment in which Mana is drawn into this TV world and gets pulled out by Six again. The next chapter introduces the duo to a dark hospital setting, in which you're provided a flashlight that you can use to observe your environments better. The hospital has a lot of elongated, tunnel-like hallways that have you moving up and down as opposed to left and right, and it does a pretty good job of making you feel uneasy. There's then a puzzle involving an x-ray to find a key hidden in stuffed animals. It's somewhat misleading since they decided to include a photo of the bear specifically with the key in it, even though the key is in a different stuffed animal. I just feel that it wasn't a necessary clue to include, and it kind of dumbed down the puzzle a bit, but the point is you use a cremation chamber to burn the toy and get the key out, which comes into play later. After the puzzle, these hand enemies are introduced, and once again you have to use the timing of swinging a two-handed weapon in order to stop them, and they take more hits to kill than the clay enemies. After the hand enemies, you're quickly introduced to another enemy type, the mannequins. Their design is alright, but the way that they move really sells the creepy factor. Their gimmick is that they can only move when you're not looking at them, a horror trope that I'm actually quite fond of, and it works well in a game like this. You have to strategically move around small groups of them while taking your time to shine the flashlight at each of them to try and prevent them from grabbing you. This works well for the first two segments, until in a third encounter with them, they just throw like 10 mannequins at you at once, and the only effective way of getting through the room is waving your flashlight all over the place while spazzing out like you're having a fucking seizure. And after that segment, you never see them again. The final enemy of the chapter is the Doctor, and the way they utilize body horror with him is done really well. Not because he's insanely fat, but because his overbite is gargantuan, and oh yeah, he moves by climbing on the ceiling. It's really disgusting to look at, but I can't knock the guy too hard. After all, at least he washes his hands. He was actually my favorite enemy to evade in the game because he actually checks under hiding places if he spots you, and if you react quick enough, you can switch hiding places before he peeks, creating actual tension instead of the fake tension that chase sequences create. Unfortunately, his sequence is too short-lived in my opinion, with there only being two rooms in which he has a chance to catch you, followed by another chase sequence that creates fake tension that I just talked about. That doesn't make him barreling towards you any less alarming, though. The end of the chase sequence ends up with you tricking him into getting stuck in a cremation chamber, and that makes him the second major enemy that the duo actually kill. Not bad for a couple of small fries. Six then makes herself look like a psychopath by warming herself up from the heat of a burning corpse. You, uh... you enjoying yourself there, Six? And that concludes chapter 3, and while I think it was an enjoyable chapter and environment overall, it kind of felt disjointed. I feel like it would have been more effective to introduce the Doctor way earlier and have him be a constant threat, combined with encountering the mannequins and severed hand enemies to have the chapter overall be more tense and horrifying. Like, imagine a segment where you have to evade the doctor in a large room, except there's a mannequin enemy that you have to keep an eye on as well that can chase you by crawling under the beds. It just feels like the entirety of the doctor enemy got pushed and squeezed to the end of the chapter. The next chapter kicks off pretty slow with an elevator puzzle that I wasn't a fan of, and if it wasn't clear before, the game now makes it very obvious that the objective is to reach a signal tower in the distance, but it's still unclear as to why. Then it starts to become more interesting, with the reveal of what has Mono attracted to these televisions so much. He unintentionally allows an enemy to enter the real world from the television, and Mono seems to have this unexplained connection to him. This enemy is known as the Thin Man, and, ignoring his clear inspiration and similarities to the Slender Man, his chase theme and the way he moves are pretty good and unsettling. The Thin Man kidnaps Six, leaving a sort of televised ghost version of her standing where she was. This explains all of the televised versions of the other children as collectibles throughout the entire game, and it also now makes the Thin Man the main antagonist. Now that you're by yourself, the rest of the chapter consists of Mono making his way through the streets to reach the signal tower. You now have the ability to use the televisions as portals, essentially, 
and backtracking puzzles are created out of it. You play as Mono throughout the chapter, avoiding what are called the TV people who are indefinitely attracted to staring at the static on the televisions, even though none of them have faces. These are kind of the most intricate puzzles in the game, though they're really mostly about positioning. That also means that this segment of traveling through the city is the slowest segment in the game, with no real stakes or tension since the TV people are really easy to get past and avoid. So this segment didn't really do it for me. But the chapter concludes with this elongated chase sequence with the Thin Man, and I thought it was fun since he usually teleports a short distance rather than walking everywhere, which personally kept me on my toes. The chase results in Mono getting injured due to his escape on a train. He walks slowly towards a ladder to the surface, seeing the Phantom of Six's image as he gets closer. It's more than clear that Mono has had quite enough of this shit as he ascends back onto the street level. He stands on the street and removes his paper bag from his head, an indication that he's done hiding. What follows is a sort of… boss? Fight? Essentially all you do is move the analog stick in a sort of search for a frequency, similar to how you previously did with all the TVs except this time you're mirroring the Thin Man's direction. For an unexplained reason, this is able to affect the Thin Man, and Mono seems to know it. The segment is short, and the Thin Man ends up dissolving away in what was a fairly badass moment for little Mono. Not too long after, you enter the broadcast tower and begin the final chapter of the game. Ascending the tower is essentially one big puzzle. It's a mesmerizing environment full of repeating hallways, doors to nowhere, and floating staircases and objects. The gimmick of the entire tower is to follow the sound of the music playing. If you hear music coming from a doorway, enter that doorway and you'll progress. Enter the wrong doorway and you'll get stuck in a loop. Think of the Lost Woods from Ocarina of Time. What awaits you at the top surprised me. You find Six, and, much like a lot of things in this world, she's now twisted, warped, and looks like a monster. This is what the Thin Man did to her, leaving her in a state of what looks like torture. She isn't hostile at first, and the only significant thing in the room with her is this music box. I did what seemed like the right thing to do. I hit the button that was used to call for her throughout the entire game, and it worked. She reacts to Mono calling her, and she moves a little closer towards him, revealing a hammer. You're meant to use the hammer to swing at the music box, which gets a reaction from her. She is now hostile, and begins chasing Mono in another chase sequence. This makes it clear that her current state is tied directly to the music box, and it's tempted her to wanting to stay that way forever. So now you go through the motions with Six as you did with the other monsters in the game. You run from her, you hide from her, except this time at the end there's what I would really consider a boss fight, or at least as close you can get to one with a game like this. Essentially there's three segments in which Six is guarding the music box, and you have to trick her into getting away from it so you can swing at it with an axe. You achieve this by going through those doors you learned about earlier. One door will take you to the opposite side of the room, and in what I personally see as an emotionally powerful inclusion, the call button is now used to lure Six towards you, as it now agitates and hurts her. It clearly reminds her of her past self. She can still remember the call, but her monstrous form is inhibiting her own individual thoughts. So the strategy is to call Six towards you, then rush through a doorway that takes you closer to the box as she heads for the original location that the call took place. It's actually fairly difficult to pull off since Mono moves so slowly while holding a melee weapon. But I enjoyed the challenge, I thought it was a good blend of puzzle mixed with taking action since there's really only one solution to hitting the box without dying in each segment. In the end, you successfully destroy the music box, and now Six is back to her past self. But now the signal tower has turned into a horror show of Lovecraftian proportions. The entire environment has turned into a massive blob of an enemy that's threatening to consume the duo. So you both run in what's the final chase sequence of the game. You both approach the exit, and Six is pretty far ahead of Mono. It seems like you might not make the jump, but luckily Six catches you like she has so many other times throughout the game. However, in what's personally the most horrifying part of the game for me, there's a really long pause as she holds you over the edge. Then she drops you.
It's a full-fledged betrayal. There's no other words for it. Mono is then left in the blobby mass by himself, and he finds a chair to sit in. He gives up. He sits, and he sits, and then he sits some more. Then another plot twist rears its ugly head. Mono is trapped there for so incredibly long that he grows into the Thin Man, the same that was chasing him not too long ago. This implies a lot of things about the story. And let me just rephrase, since it's been a while, that I have chosen to not do any additional research, and I'm taking everything from the narrative at face value here, since I think that stories that are unclear for the most part are more inviting to interpretation. So since Mono is literally the Thin Man, that means that he is clearly stuck in sort of time loop. It also explains his draw towards the Thin Man and connection to him throughout the entire game, since it's likely been himself attempting to communicate with his younger self from this limbo that he's been stuck in for so long. And he's been doing that through transmissions and frequencies. Since Six betrayed him in the past by dropping him, especially after they'd been through so much together, that's an explanation for why he kidnaps and tortures her as an adult. So in theory, the Thin Man catching you during the chase sequences in the game might actually have led to a better ending if it didn't just cut away, since the chases are likely just Mono trying to break the time loop and prevent himself from being betrayed by Six and becoming the Thin Man. So really, the Thin Man is actually the good guy, or at least a very confused, tortured soul. The one unpredictable variable here is Six herself. I can't decide if she betrayed Mono out of maliciousness, or if she betrayed him because she recognized him as the younger version of the person who was just torturing her for so long, and was trying to prevent him from growing into that person. There's a secret ending after the normal ending if you've collected all of the phantom television collectibles throughout the game, and it shows what happens after Six escapes. She sees the TV phantom version of herself, which guides her to the location in which the first game takes place. She then begins to feel the symptoms of what will become her endless hunger. This implies that the events that just preceded caused her endless hunger. I theorize it's either a side effect from her time in that horror broadcast world, or directly caused by the sheer evilness of the betrayal she just carried out, since it seems that the more terrible actions people take in this world are, the uglier they are. But once again, that's just me bouncing ideas around. And that's it for Little Nightmares 2. I think the ending they went with was bold, since you don't really feel satisfied at all after. You feel hollow and empty. But I think that that's fantastic for the type of game that this is. It's dreary, it's hopeless, and it's horrifying. You feel all of those and more with the ending than you do with facing any of the enemies throughout the game. And that's because they went with a more relatable and subtle kind of fear tactic. The fear of being betrayed by those closest to you. So yes, I really enjoyed the game, and I'm probably going to be playing it a couple of more times in the future, because it's just such a unique experience. Once again, it's not without its problems, but those don't really come to my mind when I think about this game or its predecessor overall. I'm giving this one a 4 out of 5. Thanks for watching.